I'm Rob Trusinski. This is Symposium, where we talk about the ideas at the basis of a free society. My guest today is Marian Tupi of humanprogress.org and also co-author of the new book, Superabundance. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, so I've I've been a uh, uh, I've been wanting to get you on for a while because I'm I'm a longtime fan of humanprogress.org, and this book seems to be a, a real sort of follow up to that website. But I want to talk a little bit about that website because it's one that I always recommend to people, um, and it's basically charting out. I mean, literally charting <laughs> charts and graphs, uh, charting out the the fact of human progress and the tremendous abundance we have, uh, and progress, you know, technological and economic and in some cases, educational progress, et cetera, that, that we've had over the last 200 years. Oh, that's correct. So we started about 10 years ago. We are currently working on an updated website so that it looks uh, it looks better, even better. We have, um, you know, we have a lot of data. Uh, we use data to chart human progress, but we also write about it. In other words, we try to interpret the data, explain why the last 200 years have been so much superior to the previous 300 years, 300,000 years of human experience. And uh, I, I guess uh, the idea for the website came up um, about 10 years ago when uh, a lot of free big data became available and graphics became good enough uh, so that you could start, um, you know, presenting data in a chart form and then post them on the internet. Um, and, and really the, the goal is a public service. Uh, to explain to ordinary citizens who don't have time to read books on economic history, to explain to them that the world is really getting better and that uh, even though neither the left nor the right of the political spectrum have any intention or any incentive to talk about human progress, human progress is real. Right, and, and that's the thing is that people have this sort of misconception uh, that that everything is going downhill and it, it, you know, it's it, it's something i think is, is not even changed because i i remember that that same sense when i was much younger people did the same thing that that a politics tends to reinforce the idea that oh we're in crisis because if you're in crisis mode you can get people to you know panic them into enacting your agenda whereas you know i, I guess you know the 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 so people have this resistance to wanting to see the pro the the fact of human progress. Now let's talk about the book Super Abundance because that, that can I can I actually address one little sure. point there. Um, th th that is true. I'm sure that there has never been in the past a uh, uh, a period when uh, when people have been particularly optimistic about the future of the world. I think that um, uh, th there was a lot of techno optimism uh, going all the way to the late 1960s, but I'm, I'm sure that people have always been kind of pessimistic about the future. However, um, when you look at, um, when you analyze new stories over the last, say, 40 years, or even if you look, as we did in the book that we'll be talking about in a short while, at the number of apocalyptic movies, it seems to be that there is an in, uh, an inversion here, um, whereby the better the world is doing, the more apocalyptic movies we are making and the more negative the news coverage is. So again, even though people have always been pessimistic about the future and the present, um, there is a perverse way in which uh, whilst we can show definitely unambiguously the world has gotten much better in the last say 40 years, um, the number of movies and the number of news stories uh, uh, being negative has actually increased. And, and that I do not have a particularly good explanation for, although I would say that especially in the last 20 years, what had struck me, um, certainly in the United States, is that, that there is no constituency for saying that things are going well. So when the Republicans are in charge, Democrats don't want to give them uh, any benefit of the doubt. You know, everything is being destroyed. Everything is horrible. When Republican, when Democrats are in charge, Republicans do the same thing, uh, and 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 therefore people have no really no access to 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 the realistic picture of the world. Yeah, I've noticed that an inversion in science fiction, and you know, we talk about when you have debates about artificial intelligence, it's like people's sole model for dealing with what, what will artificial intelligence look like is, oh, well, did you see that movie where robots, you know, rise up and, 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 and kill us all uh, the, the, the Terminator or age of Ultron or whatever it is that becomes, I think that's part of the problem is that becomes people's sole model for what technological progress is going to look like is, oh, it's going to be some kind of catastrophe. 
Yes, that's absolutely. Yeah, I, I was amused actually that uh, um, I think it was this year we passed the date in which Soylent Green, you know, one of the, one of these previous uh, catastrophe movies was supposed to take place, in which we're all going, the world is overpopulated, and we're all going to be starving to death. And you know, we just passed that date, and it, of course, it's it, the exact opposite is happening. Um, yeah. Soylent yeah. Green features prominently in the presentations I give about uh, superabundance. Uh, because it was uh, it was uh, it was based really on the on the panic an intellectual panic and a moral panic that started with uh, Ehrlich's publication of in 1968 of the population bomb that we'll talk about uh, probably in a while. But it is striking that uh, that Soul and Green, even though it was made in 1973, was supposed to have culminated in 2022. And the premise uh, of the movie, which people should see just for the outrageous nature of the predictions was that every time a person dies, they are turned into cookies called uh, soil and green, which are then fed to people who are still alive. So th that was the kind of thing that can actually scare and scar uh, generations of people. Yeah. So let's talk about the book Super Abundance. I think the name itself is sort of like throwing this in people's faces. Yes. Uh, the idea that it was super abundant. And I, I as I, uh, it, the the idea that the population bomb or the, the idea of overpopulation or greater population being a problem seems to be kind of central to the to the theme of it so go ahead and just, just describe what the book's that's about correct. and and how and how that what that approach is that's correct so as far as back as we can tell probably fifth century bc people had been wondering about the relationship between population and resources and uh, not everybody was skeptical but as a general as a general um as a general guide uh, people have been deeply uh, ambivalent about population growth and very often hostile to it um, because they were wedded to this idea that uh, the more people you have, the you know, that, that population increases like this, but food uh, production increases only like that. And therefore, you know, at some point you're going to have too many people, too few resources, starvation occurs and that sort of thing. And, 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 and in, in reality, um, you know, life was very hard and uh, there had been famines um, caused by bad harvests and things like that. Um, and, and so, you know, on, on one reading of Malthus, he was actually a decent historian in a sense that he was actually reflecting on the world as it existed before the 18th century when things have changed dramatically uh, for the better. Um, but uh, but th this this idea... Um, Malthusian idea was obviously promoted, or rather, it was it was created by this guy called Thomas Malthus, who was an uh, was an Anglican preacher in in Britain in the 18th century, and wrote the book on principle of population, which was published in 1798. And then Ehrlich, uh, Paul Ehrlich, who is still alive, um, the the biologist from Stanford University, resurrected uh, or resuscitated this idea in 1968 in a very popular book, The Population Bomb. It sold something like three million copies. He was on Johnny Carson. Um, 20 or 21 times he was a real force um, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in public debate now you might ask given that this debate is 50 years old mm. why on earth would you want to spend your time three years of your life looking into this um, and the answer to this is very simple whereas the academic debate has moved on and very few uh, people actually believe a, a very few people very few bona fide, genuinely concerned uh, environmentalists believe that we are going to run out of resources. The public has not caught up with this notion. We know that because we do have public figures like, uh, for example, Bill Maher uh, or AOC talking about it. But more importantly, uh, we have people acting on the Malthusian principle in real life to very dramatic effects. So the guy who shot and killed 20 people in uh, in uh, Walmart in uh, in El Paso about three years ago left behind him a uh, testament of some kind, uh, which claimed basically we are using far too many resources. There are far too many people. You guys, meaning Americans, are not going to do anything about it. Therefore, I have to start by murdering a lot of you and in fact in public polling and in just general conversations uh, it's obvious that people are still wedded to the Malthusian ideas because it is completely intuitive meaning more people fewer resources and therefore we have a job to do as policy analysts and as people who are interested in the future 
to kill this idea, not just in academia, but also in 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 public domain. Now, I, I noticed this. Uh, that seems to be that the the spirit of Julian Simon is hanging over a lot of this because, you know, during Paul Ehrlich's heyday in the sixties and seventies, his sort of nemesis was Julian Simon, who who wrote the book The Ultimate Resource, making that argument that more humans actually means more ingenuity, more invention, uh, and will create more resources that you know, instead of the population goes up like this and resources go up like this, it'll be population goes up like this and resources go up like that, even right. more steeply. And this is kind of like a, a 50 year later follow up to that saying, yeah, yes, that actually happened. That's, yes, this yes. is true. Yes. Uh, Julian Simon was an economist at University of Maryland. He was also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, much smarter senior fellow at the Kento Institute than I am, I can assure you of that, but he was a massive influence on us. A um, couple of things about that. One was the famous bet between Ehrlich and Simon, which started in 1980. And basically Ehrlich picked five commodities. I think it was tungsten, tin, copper, zinc, something else. And um, uh, he put a thousand dollars on it. And basically if the prices of those commodities went down, he would pay Simon, if the prices went up, Simon would pay Ehrlich. Well, 10 years later in 1990, the, the prices of those five commodities adjusted by, by, uh, for inflation fell by 36%. And so Ehrlich had to send a check for $576 to, to Simon. And that was, that was a big breakthrough. Now, when I say that Simon was an inspiration, that's for sure. But uh, we did something that need, that Simon and Early didn't do, which is to translate prices uh, into into time prices. We are not using real prices. Real prices, as your uh, as your viewers and listeners will appreciate, are just nominal prices adjusted for inflation. Um, time prices are uh, basically what is happening to the price of commodities relative to wages. Real prices don't account for wage increases, right? So if if a price, if a real price of something declines, it may be because there was technological breakthrough. Maybe you have discovered new deposits. Uh, maybe you have become more efficient, whatever. Um, but that only gives you half of the story. Innovation, which, which is translated into real prices, only tells you what is happening in the production process of that commodity. But there is another half. What is happening to wages? Because people are also becoming more productive, right? So you need to adjust prices for wage growth. And this is what where time prices come into it. Innovation, in other words, translates or materializes in real world, both in declining prices of commodities, but also increasing wages as humanity becomes more productive. And so to calculate the time price, it's very simple. In 1980, you take a nominal price of a, uh, I don't know, a, a bag of potatoes, and you divide it by the nominal hourly wage in 1980. And you repeat the process in 2020 or 2022. Again, nominal price of a good divided by the hourly nominal wage. And that's what gives you the time price. And time price is measured in minutes and hours, whereas uh, obviously real prices are measured in uh, inflation adjusted dollars. So based on that, we can say how many minutes you had to work in order to earn something in 1980 versus how many minutes you had to work in order to afford something in 2020. And that was the what we think is not necessarily an improvement on, on, on the early Simon wager, but more like a different angle. Right. And perhaps and that, perhaps and in an improvement and a little contribution that we have made. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely. And and I also I think it highlights something that, you know, when you talk about this, one of the rejoinders you get is, well, oh, sure, sure, we've made technological progress. We've made material progress. One of the rejoinders you get, especially from the right is, oh, but our culture has collapsed. Our culture has gone downhill. Uh, our quality of life has has decreased or some some such thing. And and one of the things I like to point out is that there is also a a moral and uh, cultural dimension of the progress that we've had, that people have more access to education, they have more leisure time, they have, you know, m more uh, ability to pursue things that are not just, you know, newer, better gadgets, but are also improved quality of life. Well, that's right. And the less time you have to work in order to afford the basics, the more time you have left in order to do with your life whatever it is that you want to do with your life. Now, not everybody is going to make the right choices. Mm -hmm. Some people are perfectly happy to live in a basement, smoke pot, mm -hmm. and watch Netflix. Um, that, that you know, it's it's not 
the choice that I would make, but I'm a libertarian, more power to you, do what with your life, whatever you want. Other people uh, go back to college to take a course they always wanted to take or read a book they always wanted to read or go on a trip or simply do nothing and just relax and spend time with their with their family so the the, the key to time prices is that the less time we have to work the more time we have to do other things and um on the point of moral progress um you know Moral progress is a very big part of human progress overall, and there are a lot of ways in which we can measure it. For example, uh, people no longer sacrifice their children to the rain god. As I recently found out when I was in Mexico, I was at this very interesting place, uh, just a gorgeous, beautiful, impressive city, the name of which I, I just cannot pronounce. And, uh, you know, the tour guide told us that, so, you know, once a year in order to ensure the, the rain, um, you know, five to seven year old kids would be, would, would, would have their throats slit, not to mention about conventional human sacrifice. Uh, we no longer treat women uh, as men. Uh, we no longer treat women as personal property. Uh, in fact, they run many countries around the world. Uh, we no longer torture people in order to exact from them some kind of a confession. Um, we no longer enslave people. Uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, uh, in America, I realized that, you know, people talk about slavery a lot uh, as though it's a particularly American sin. I mean, this has been happening around the world, at least since the agricultural revolution. And um, uh, people have been enslaving each other. And then in this magnificent, extraordinary 18th century, it suddenly occurs to people that maybe it's a more humane and more moral world that we don't have to enslave one another. And then you have this complete flip whereby Western nations start extinguishing slavery, not just in their own colonies, but also, also around the world, like in the Ottoman Empire and elsewhere. Um, so well, the treatment of animals, uh, used as Steven Pinker uh, describes so vividly in his book, um, Enlightenment Now, people used to have a great time, you know, nailing cats to, to wooden poles and then pelting them with rocks and rotten fruit. Um, you know, so, so we are in many ways a gentler, more humane, uh, more sophisticated species than people who came before us. And I also think there's a connection there between the, the, the moral progress and the material progress or the technological progress work together in the sense that, you know, when you have, it's more possible for women to have opportunities to work and to, and to, you know, to pursue an education, et cetera, you have, you know, half of humanity basically is, is adding its contributions to uh, creating resources, to coming up with new ideas. Uh, when you no longer have slavery, again, a huge number of people who are, uh, uh, who are, whose productivity, whose, whose potential is being, uh, had been you know extinguished, which is now being unleashed. Well, that's right. Um, if you look at the most socially progressive, uh, maybe I shouldn't use that word. <laughs> when I look at uh, socially most accepting, well, uh, I think I think we should take back socially progressive as you know, because it has this this overtones because there's like people who call themselves progressives who have a certain very narrow set of beliefs. But what the rest of us would accept as progress, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, socially liberal uh, countries uh, that treat women and gays and 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 Jews and and black people and and whatever else uh, in a in a humane way. It's it's uh, it's almost invariably very very rich countries, and that maybe has to do with the Maslow pyramid of of needs. That when you are at the very bottom, what you do care about is food and water and shelter and se private secure uh, and and personal security. But the higher up the Maslow pyramid, you 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 move, um, you know your your needs, your desires change until you get to the very top, where what you care about is really um, the society that you live in. You want it to reflect your personal your your personal values and preferences. Now that's that's a good thing, if your preferences are say for example, I just want people to be free and um, you know, but 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 that can also be a bad thing if, for example, your idea of a perfect society is one that is an egalitarian hellhole. Yeah. Or, you or, know. or, you know, that your idea of a perfect society is go back to nature and, and uh, deindustrialize everything. Um, degrowth, de yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, degrowth. So, well, and that's an interesting thing because you know, we, we see versions of this on the left and versions on the right. They each have their sort of their own vision of what an illiberal anti-progress society would be. And you talk about Maslow's pyramid, and it struck me that um, 
I wonder to what extent our politics now is oddly, you know, perversely shaped by Maslow's pyramid in the sense that um, you, know, you talked about this paradox that the better the world gets, the more pessimistic people get. And to some extent, you know, I'm wondering, because I remember, you know, when I was, uh, you know, go back 50, 60 years, um, the big economic, the big political issues in America were you had on the left, you had the war on, you, know, you had the war on poverty. And on the right, you know, a few years later, perhaps as a consequence, you had the misery index, right, which is you took inflation and you added it to unemployment. That was the misery index. And these sort of economic issues, issues of economic survival seemed to be the really salient issues, whereas today it's like the culture war dominates everything. And I'm wondering how that fits fit into Maslow's pyramid in the sense that, you know, precisely because everything's better off, we get to have these knockdown dragouts arguments over, you know, well, was this book being carried in a public in a school library a bad book or is it bad to ban it? You know, we get to have these arguments that are on the culture war issues because so many of the other problems have been uh, have gotten better. Yes, it is a uh, that is a question that uh, we are beginning to start thinking about. In other words, uh, more that I look at the data, I'm beginning to think about the limitations of human psychology and uh, where the human psyche is leading us. And certainly one of the plausible hypotheses that I want to explore in the future, but I haven't done so yet, mm is that when, when you get to the top of the Maslow pyramid, then what your, you get your jollies from, from having the society reflect your own values. In other words, what, 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 you, what you are spending uh, every, every increasing amount of time is um, making sure that, that your conception of perfect society is reflected by the government by the uh, by the society at large and of course that is deeply problematic uh unworkable and potentially self-destructive in a society where we do not agree on the hierarchy of values um now part of the reason why i find liberty centered approach to life more convincing than others is because in my perfect society, people are perfectly able to create their own socialist communes. In other words, the, the reason, it, it's not that I'm a socialist and far from it, the exact opposite, but I have absolutely no problem with people on the basis of personal preference and with the right of exit to create a socialist commune. Um, that's perfectly compatible with living in a free society. Um, what is not compatible with uh, living in a in a free society is, is or, or with freedom is an egalitarian community where you are prevented from uh, acquiring wealth and doing with it whatever you want. So th that's why I'm a libertarian. Is that I think um, you can you can do whatever you want with your life. Now, um, what I want to talk about the effect that this anti-progress view or this this denial of progress has on politics more broadly, which is. I think that when you view everything as a catastrophe, you know, with there, where where we're we're twelve years away from the Earth becoming uninhabitable, or uh, which is sort of the oversimplified version of the the this the 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 panic on the on the left, or where you know the nation's decaying because of too many immigrants or too many this or too many that, and we're going into this this sort of moral collapse of society, which is the view on on the right. How does you know how does that change your politics versus how we would approach politics if we actually grasped the reality of progress? Well, I think that if we let 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 me start with the second question first. I, I think that if we embrace the reality of progress, then we would see uh, humanity as a fundamentally as a, as a force for good, um, because um, uh, the more people we have the greater distribution of labor we have, um, which, which takes care of trade, uh, but also we have many more minds uh, which can be applied to solving the, the, the problems that we have and that we are going to have in the future. So you're combining by, by humanity and freedom, you're combining both the, the free trade, the sort of smithing growth, and then the Schumpeterian growth. Uh, where which is you know the Schumpeterian growth is largely driven by by technological change and technological change depends on 
innovations which are the product of human mind and if you don't have humans then you don't have ideas and you don't have technological change so i i think that um first of all we would start valuing humans again as as not just destroyers of the world but also creators of value and protectors of the environment and protectors of, of the world uh, you know sort of two steps forward, one step back. We are obviously consumers, but we are also producers. Um, it would place techno-optimism at the center of the human enterprise. In other words, you look at a problem not as a final word that, you know, this is something that is going to destroy us, but rather as a problem that needs to be solved through the application of human intelligence. Um, and it would imbue us with gratitude for people who came before us with an optimism about future um with which my understanding is i'm i i don't remember this because i'm i'm not old enough but my understanding is that in the early 1960s this is very much what what many americans believed in you know i have a friend who is now in his 80s uh who who, who tells me that people in the early 60s fully expected to meet each other in the year 2000 on alpha centauri um, because they thought, you know, that there was this almost infinite amount of progress they were going to see over the succeeding 40 years. Um, the, the opposite of that is, of course, a vision of the world that uh, sees humanity as a cancer on the world, which convinces men and women who want to have children that it is immoral to bring children into the world because their future is going to be horrible. It is a future of the world where you embrace degrowth. I don't think that degrowth is going to be embraced by th through 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 elections. In other words, I don't think that uh, ordinary men and women in this country or anywhere else are going to vote um, in order to bring about a destruction of their of their of their standards of living. But we can already see degrowth penetrating policy making in the West even though the people themselves don't necessarily want it. They just don't have a choice out of the respectable political parties in the political spectrum, whether it be center-right or center-left. They have all bought into this apocalyptic vision of the world where, where we have to embrace degrowth and therefore you know, essentially reduce the human uh, footprint and also reduce the amount of stuff that we produce. Everybody has to basically become poorer. And what happens then when people cannot choose between the center left and the center right, they start electing populists, communists, and fascists. And that can lead to much bigger problem than just economic problems. That can lead to war, it can lead to genocide. And so we could well be in a fork in the road where we can embrace this human-centered, techno-optimistic vision of the future, or degrowth nightmare um driven driven by anti-democratic forces and i think there is an inherent illiberalism to catastrophism because the idea is that if it's a catastrophe and and we're all on the brink of 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 extinction or of, or of collapse then you're going to be less patient with you know arguing things out in in the public square and arguing things out through the ordinary mechanisms of politics you're going to be more inclined to say, no, no, we need to sweep away the barriers to, to doing this dramatic, this drastic solution that we need. You're also more likely to think we need, you know, we need not just incremental reforms to the existing system, but we need to have a revolution and tear the whole system down uh, because you don't have that, that, I think you put it gratitude, you don't have that appreciation for what, you know, the, the existing system, the existing way of doing things has accomplished. And also, I think you get that you get an adversarialism in politics uh, that, you know, my group versus your group, because if, if everything's collapsing, if we're degrowthing, it's all it's a call of competition between my group versus your group. And we're all fighting over turnips you know, <laughs> to to uh, to try to feed ourselves uh, rather than rather than, you know, sharing in this uh, when, when you have expansion and abundance, there's enough for everyone to share. Yes, uh, George Will likes to say that the difference between America in gloom and America ecstatic is the difference between a 2% economic growth rate a year and a 3% economic growth rate a year, right? <laughs> because that's not just a difference of one 
one percent. It's a different of one percentage point, which is to say it's a, it's a difference. Between, it, it it's a fifty percent increase. Um, you know, from 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 two to three uh, percent. What you say about system is very important. Uh, we refuse, and and this is where postmodernists come into it. We refuse to acknowledge. Let alone, we refuse to celebrate. Let, sorry, we we refuse to acknowledge, let alone celebrate, that the West got something right. We refuse to explain to the children um, in, in high school and university, especially in university, what is it about private property rights, about free press, about the rule of law, uh, about stable money, which has enabled the West to take off in the last 200 years, and then for the rest, by adopting similar institutions to catch up with us. We are ashamed of these institutions. Um, and um, of course, we all know, because we are classical liberals, that no institution is perfect. We know that because institutions are ultimately made up of people and people are not perfect. So there is within the classical liberalism, um, th there, is a, there is an avenue or a road out of it, and it's called incremental change. That when our institutions fall short, we identify within those institutions the, the tweaks that we need to make in order to make the institutions ever more perfect, realizing that they will never be perfect because human beings are imperfect, right? But, um, but our progressive friends are determined to destroy the system root and branch, assuming that out of the ashes of the old system, something better will emerge like, like Phoenix. Um, uh, and th there's absolutely no reason to think that that will happen. Um, there is no reason that out of a revolution, uh, you will be able to create a system uh, that is going to work better than than what we already have. God knows that the French Revolution um, has uh, sh should have told us that, but um, you know we we are where we are. Um, well, I think one of the things people don't appreciate is that liberal institutions were not created on the sen on the on the premise of human beings being perfect. They were created specifically on the premise of being able to be correctable and be able to be changeable and be able to be reformable uh and and that that reformability and correctability is built into liberal institutions that they are the answer to their own imperfections and i think to some extent you know that the faculty of self-criticism is built into liberal institutions but it's almost like it's become it's the the faculty of self-criticism have gotten us so far out of control that it has turned back it's been used to turn back on those institutions themselves yeah, I mean, just by analogy, when I went to university, it was a relatively happy time uh, in the mid to late 1990s, when history started being taught in a uh, from, not solely from a Western centric point of view. So in other words, it was roughly at that time that um, we realized that there was much more to the world than than the West centric approach. And the idea in the academia in the late 1990s was that we are going to celebrate the good parts uh, of, of Western culture and Western history, and we are going to enrich that with also taking into consideration contributions of other civilization to the entire global stock of human knowledge. And somewhere over the last 20 years, we forgot about that first pillar, which was that you know, about the Western pillar. And we focused solely on the rest of the world to the detriment of teaching about Western values and Western successes and Western contributions. And in fact, what has happened was that by elevating non-Western uh, contributions, we academics also feel the need to squash as much as possible the the, the Western contributions. In other words, the, the, an imbalance, an inversion has happened. Mm -hmm. Whereas before it was all West and nothing else. Now it's everything else and no West. And, and that, is, that is not a good place to be because, because the, the reality is it doesn't matter how upset people get by this. It, the reality is that it was in the West in 1800s and the late 1700s that human progress took off. We need to be able to identify the reasons why that happened and um, and preserve those values. It's just an unavoidable fact of history. Now, I want to I close by talking about this, this psychological resistance to progress. And I, I what I see as sort of the basis, the natural basis for it is for a lot of human history, 
you know, life was much tougher than it is today. That is, you know, you go back and you you read, you know, uh, people from the 18th century and before who were talking about how, you know, uh, how fragile life is, and you know, you could you could get a disease at any moment and 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 uh, suffer some sort of tragedy. And there was a sense of life being short, being vulnerable, being tenuous. And it was grounded in, to, to, you know, to, in a certain amount of reality that, you know, the, the infectious diseases, there was no real answer to them, that, uh, uh, you know, modern medicine didn't exist. A lot of the technological progress that supports modern hygiene and things like that, that didn't exist yet. It wasn't possible. Um, you know, I, 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 we talked about the takeoff in the 1800s. I, I, I don't want to denigrate the fact that there was progress that happened prior to that you know there's thousands of years of the foundations being laid and, and of things moving forward in various ways but the average person wouldn't have experienced that really during his lifetime as being you know it wouldn't have experienced like, like my grandfather you know had a lifetime that spanned from the invention of the first airplane to landing on the moon you didn't see that kind of extraordinary progress so i'm wondering if there's just a a natural resistance that our, our culture hasn't really absorbed yet that, that this progress takeoff of progress is so new that we haven't been able to absorb it psychologically and culturally. Yes. So, so with regard to your first point, I think it's crucial to, to distinguish between innovation and sustained innovation. So human beings have always innovated. Um, you know, we took control of fire about 1.7 million years ago. We had the bronze age starting 3000 BC, what, whatever. Um, the, these things tend to happen, but they, they were, very far apart, and they had very limited effect on on uh, standards of living. So, so I would distinguish between innovation, which always happened, and then sustained innovation, which is the story of the last two hundred and fifty years or so. And that, to me, is deeply connected to the spread of economic and political freedom. Is that once you have a certain critical mass of of uh, population and freedom, it's not just that we have more people but that people for the first time in human history are able to interact with one another um, with a modicum of freedom and dignity. Um, Europe, again, plays a vital, vitally important role here because it is, of course, dismembered. It is not an empire. They have their own empires outside of Europe, but Europe itself is a highly competitive interjurisdictional environment where intellectuals and ideas can just leave your country if you are particularly brutal and they can go and live in Switzerland where things are better or in Holland where there is much more freedom of speech, etc. And so by competing against one another, Europeans are forced to, to increase the, the liberal treatment of their citizens so that, uh, so that they don't become like Spain right, which is just intellectually and technologically dead space, right? And um, and, and and same in economics, you know, in the, 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 say 1500s, 1600s, uh, if you wanted to export something from Britain to Holland, you would need to get the queen or the king to give you a patent, a monopoly on import and export of salt and wool and whatever else. And by the 1800s, anyone can do it. You know, tariffs have fallen. Uh, econo the economy has liberalized, and so, so I think that that, that was a very important aspect. Um, this this sort of rise of liberalism, and, and and there is a reason why we call the 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 nineteenth century and the late eighteenth century the 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 era of liberalism. So it's the spread of economic freedom. Now I'm not sure that, that was the first part of your question. Your second part was, um, oh, about about human propensity to 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 see the negative. Well. As I think you implied in your question, given how old our species were and how extraordinarily hard life was, it would be quite surprising if we have internalized the expectation of improvement in this very short period of 200 years, right? So if, if archaeological records are correct, we are about 300,000 years old. Most people think it's 200,000, but we do have some records that may be 300,000 years old. And then prosperity is maybe 100, 150 years old. So, you know, you would expect that our species have evolved to be pessimistic, right? Uh, the um, to 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 expect something horrible to happen next year and therefore to stock up on corn and weapons and whatever was a much more 
much better survival mechanism than uh, saying, yeah, it will probably work out. <laughs> So, so what I, like, I guess my, the, to, that leads to the question of what do we, what do you need to, what do we need to do to sort of propagate that idea and get us more accustomed and acculturated to the reality of progress, and also to the expectation of progress of wanting to say, okay, because I think the the real the the real mental change that we need is to move, as you said, from from looking at oh, you know, the, everything's a catastrophe, we're going downhill to asking what amazing new thing can we do next and why aren't we doing that and let's move forward as fast as possible. What do we need to do to change that that sort of natural mentality? And I know that you're writing books like Superabundance and, and sites like humanprogress.org are a part of that. Yeah, look, um, here's the book, by the way, Superabundance. Um, that's what I've written. Um, and I started a, a, a website called humanprogress.org. And the reason why I did that is because I know um, that the data shows hundreds of years of, of tremendous progress that would have been unimaginable to people before us. Um, um, and, and that is my particular area. That's what I've decided to do. Uh, other people may do it differently. Some people may want to start a movie making company, uh, you know, make films, um, um, you know, like Emergent Order uh, or uh, or Kite and Kate um, about um, about the improving state of the world. Um, and I also think a, 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 it's, it's, optimistic it's, science fiction is one of the things that I that I it's my one of my crusades here is the the optimistic view. Of, you know, it's, it's just interesting. Star Trek is usually held up as this. And I always found it fascinating that if you actually look at what they say about the past, you know, from, from the Star Trek universe is it's always extremely pessimistic in the short term. We're going to have a nuclear war. We're going to have eugenics war. We're going to have all this horrible upheaval in the in the late 20th and early 21st century, which they keep having to push forward because it never happens. But the idea is that then we're going to solve all those problems. And then we're going to go into this amazing future and we're going to go travel to the stars. And that op sense of optimism in, in science fiction has been to some extent lost. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, what I find so interesting is that it's not necessarily that, I mean, I mean, some people are, uh, some people for, for whom, some people for whom gloom is so much part of their personality and so much part of their worldview, they will reject the very idea of progress in order to maintain the the pristine nature of their philosophical beliefs is that you know, humans are cancer, we are going to destroy. But, but I also encounter a different group of people who simply have never encountered positive news in their entire lives. They read, you know, uh, they are they're, they're centrists. They are not particularly right wing. They are not particularly left wing. They are just reading the newspapers, watching the TV, and they have never been told about these long term trends. Um, and when they hear the the, the facts uh, as as I describe them at a dinner party or over drinks, um, they feel happier. But everybody has a role to play. Mine is to write books and run a website. Uh, what I would say is that what I found was for for all of your listeners who are interested in making a positive difference in the world and um, and and trying to spread the message that a liberal society has delivered tremendous improvements and can deliver more. The one thing that works is making friends with uh, people who have a lot of reach. In other words, these uh, these uh, the people with a lot of Twitter followers, uh, people with um, uh, columns in newspapers, um, you know, people who, who can reach millions of people. I cannot do it. My book is not going to sell millions of copies. I wish it did, but it probably won't. Uh, neither I go, am I going to have a podcast that is going to reach millions of people. But befriending and, and talking to people who have millions of followers and convincing them, that can have a sort of an avalanche-like effect whereby, um, whereby people will, whereby you can start at least hope that you're going to change public opinion. Um, you know, you can do it in your universe. I can do it in my universe. Um, if somebody can convince Joe Rogan that uh, the world is getting better, 
then Joe Rogan can have people like us on his podcast talking about the improving state of the world, and then 60 million people will listen to it. Um, but I think that targeting these high value individuals and uh, convincing them of the reality of the world is probably the best um, strategy that has occurred to me. Yeah, well, I think it's just something that has to reach a certain critical mass. You know, you, you at this point where you you could be arguing about something over a period of many years, and you suddenly reach just enough people with that message that it begins to become. And I, I've I've noticed that actually, <clears throat> I guess my optimistic my optimistic view of optimism <laughs> is that um, you know I I've I've been an advocate of this progress pro progress mindset for you know I've been saying a lot, writing a lot about it for 20 years, 20 years or so. And it seemed like there were a lot fewer people saying this 20 yeah. years ago. And now there's human progress at org and there's, you know, Stephen Pinker has been out doing it. Uh, and there seems to be sort of a, a burst of this. And there's even people having a, creating a field called progress studies of making it, a, making it a discipline that we're going to study the fact of progress and the causes of progress and look at, you know, how, what, what is required to achieve this progress and that Absolutely. seems to be there seems to be a sort of a blossoming of that. And my hope is that as that blossoms, it then expands out and gets in more into the pop culture and into the into, into the mainstream. Yes. And, you know, there, there's just so much good literature out there. Norberg and, and Cowan on, on some days. He's not always <laughs> optimistic, but on some days. Uh, uh, brilliant man, uh, Lomborg, uh, Pinker, Ridley. There's just a there's now a library of of studies of progress. Uh, Jason Crawford from Roots of Progress, yeah. uh, uh, wonderful stuff. And what you say must be true. It must be true because we know that there was a time when humans believed in all sorts of things which happened not to be true, and they have flipped when it when it reached a a certain critical mass. Heliocentrism is now accepted by you know, over 90% of people, close to 100% of people, although I have met flat earthers in yeah. my life. Um, you know, we no longer believe that by sacrificing our children, we are going to bring about rain or better harvests. Um, so so th th there, there has to be a way in which, in which we can flip this. Uh, we just need more people, more connected people um, uh, saying these things and uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for doing your part on that. And thanks for coming on the podcast. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm Rob Trzynski. My guest today has been Marian Tupi, co-author of Super Abundance, and also from the, the website, which I highly recommend you go to to get all the facts and figures, which is humanprogress.org. Uh, if you like this interview, uh, be sure to hit like uh, on YouTube or subscribe to our podcast. And you can always find more discussion about the ideas of the basis of a free society at Symposium. That's symposium.substack.com. Symposium Thank you for joining the conversation.